In 2020, the French government issued a 7 billion euro loan to national carrier Air France to overcome the worst crisis in its history. But there was a condition. The airline would have to limit all domestic flights for a journey of less than two and a half hours. Passengers, apart from those on connecting flights, would have to hop on a train if they wanted to travel from Paris to Lyon or Bordeaux. A year later, the ban expanded to all regional flights in France, eliminating around 12% of French domestic travel. Other European countries followed suit. Austrian airlines received a 600 million euro bailout on the same condition, starting with cutting a flight from Vienna to Salzburg. To soften the blow, the Austrian carrier partnered with national rail operator UBB to offer extra rail connections. KLM with Dutch and Belgian railways, as well as Lufthansa and Deutsche Bahn share the same type partnerships. By banning select short-haul flights, EU countries are trying to achieve carbon-cutting goals per the Paris agreements and double all high-speed rail traffic by 2030. Comparing all modes of transportation, flights are the most significant contributor of CO2 emissions, while trains contribute the least. And if the EU stays determined to follow their mobility strategy, we will see even more strides in this direction. Could this mean that we're returning to an era of rail dominance? Let's talk about whether the rail revival is possible and how soon it might be with us. If you want to see what rail dominance might look like, check out China. China has the world's largest network of high-speed railways, ranging over 23,000 miles. There, trains on many lines go as fast as 217 miles per hour and are the symbol of a prosperous economy. Fares are cheap, booking and boarding are fast and efficient, and the travel time can rival that of airplanes if you consider the time spent coming and going to the airport. Unfortunately, in other parts of the world, like the US and Europe, trains, at least for long journeys, are a thing of the past. Why so? What stops them from following in China's successful footsteps? The trains are great. You can stretch your legs, take a pet with you, visit the dining car, use Wi-Fi, and enjoy the scenery. Unfortunately, these are not the main considerations when choosing a form of transportation. The main downside of train travel is travel time. Ryanair will take you from Barcelona to Seville in an hour and a half. By train, the same journey is five hours. And this is the high-speed rail we're talking about. Spain actually has Europe's largest high-speed train network comprising 1,900 miles of track, second only to China. Obviously, we're not comparing them, but despite being so condensed, Europe's international high-speed network is not that vast. In the US, with its only high-speed line, trains are not a long-distance travel option. There are two solutions to this, and Europe is already on track to get them. First is, of course, widening the high-speed rail network. Europe is developing the Trans-European Transport Network to eventually connect over 400 major cities and cut travel time in half. For example, getting passengers from Copenhagen to Hamburg in two and a half hours instead of today's four and a half. The EU is committed to completing construction of most of these high-speed rail connections by 2040. In the States, the situation is less positive. With all Amtrak's intercity services operating at under 100 miles per hour, the U.S. lacks the high-speed rail infrastructure. Building it would take decades and hundreds of billions of dollars, and such an ambitious project hasn't even reached the planning stage. What about Elon Musk's Hyperloop construction? In theory, these high-speed bullet trains could reach the speed of 760 miles per hour and surpass air travel. But with the ongoing research, it's unclear when or if we'll ever have just one working route, let alone a nationwide network. The second solution to tackling long train journeys is night trains. The original long haul journey method, sleeper trains, can be more budget friendly for passengers traveling in a shared compartment or on the luxe side with private rooms and a more romantic flair. In 2019, over 1.5 million people traveled on UBB Nightjet, the Austrian operator's overnight train service. 
driving the company to order 33 new sleeper trains by 2023. Another shining example is the proposal to revive the iconic Trans-Europe Express. This international first-class rail service was popular in the 1970s and spanned the whole of Central and Western Europe. Proposed by the German government, the new vision would incorporate existing lines and add new ones, which can be done in a short time. For a traveler on a budget, travel time might not be the most pressing aspect, but travel costs might be. Cheaper usually beats more expensive due to dynamic pricing that airlines are employing. Flight rates can be higher or lower, depending, for example, on how close to the departure date you're booking. At this point in time, a Hamburg Munich one hour flight by Lufthansa costs more than Deutsche Bahn's seven hour journey. This is a no brainer for people who have the time, but the price questions can change drastically if there's a low cost airline in the picture. That round trip Barcelona Seville flight by Ryanair is pretty cheap, but if you want to travel by train, you will spend the same amount or even more on a one way ticket. So not only is the journey longer, it's twice as expensive. Of course, there are more factors at play. For example, Ryanair bag policies are brutal and can set you back six euros for a 10 kilogram carry-on. AVE allows you to take three bags for a total weight of 25 kilograms for no extra charge. Besides, by choosing the train, you won't have to pay for a taxi to and from the airport since it will take you directly to the city center. After landing, we're still one hour away from the city center. <laughs> But these are rarely considerations that people make in one-to-one -one comparisons. When they are undecided, the third aspect enters, travel convenience. Comfort is subjective, and it covers tons of elements, some outweighing others. For example, the train is the only travel mode allowing you to take a short walk without pausing the trip. At the same time, a train journey spanning several days and multiple changes is not at all comfortable in comparison to a two-leg flight that takes one day. But there's one convenience factor that airlines are objectively better at than rail operators, booking and ticketing. Booking a train trip, especially an international one, is not easy. Online travel agencies and meta search engines are not always integrated with train booking systems. So travelers can't typically compare different transportation modes by price and travel time. Google is one of the rare meta search sites that do that, but only for supported carriers. Indirect journeys can also be a problem. Most airlines have interlining agreements that support booking, ticketing, and refunds with no hassle for passengers. But rail operators are often responsible only for their portion of the trip. So travelers must manually find and book all legs of their journeys. There are rail OTAs like Trainline, Omeo, or Rail Europe, but they don't connect to every operator. The good news is that the EU recognizes the problem. By 2030, the European Commission plans to remove technical barriers and improve data access and infrastructure that's currently blocked by national rules and policies. By industry standards, that's fast. But by traveler demand, it's long overdue. Passengers are passionate about skipping planes and going by rail. In 2020, this concept map of the U.S. high-speed rail network went viral, with people sharing their desires to someday experience the comfort of long-haul train journeys in the States. The problem is not in the lack of demand, but in poor or even in non-existent availability. Here, privately funded projects might be the ones to finally give Americans a modern rail network. In Europe, the situation is a bit more promising, with tons of national and EU-wide projects aimed at popularizing rail journeys and making them more accessible. For now, long-haul and international travel by air is dominant. But if the EU plans materialize, by 2030, we'll have a larger high-speed network and night trains will become more commonplace. This way, we can distribute traffic between people who prefer speed and those who crave comfort. Air and rail transport can individually offer benefits the other mode, at least currently, can't. So it only makes sense to build strong infrastructural and technical connections between the two, like allowing passengers to get interlining tickets the same convenient way airline code sharing is implemented, or providing a centralized overview of all available options on the same platform, so people can consider other, greener, more comfortable alternatives.